Welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be testing the Canon R5 for photography, image quality, and image stabilization. Thank you for joining me. We're here in a nature preserve in Ojai, California, and it's a beautiful place to shoot. So let's get into it. You're a beautiful person and you're a good person. And if no one has told you that today, let me be the first person to tell you that. All right, thanks for joining today's video. When I ran in the Canon uh, R5, I couldn't do what I normally would do when I um, talk about a piece of gear, be it a camera body or a lens or some other accessory. Um, and I usually talk about the use price performance formula or equation that I refer to, which is what are you gonna use it for? how does it perform at that purpose and then what is the price point point? and um, so I usually kind of give a, a review that's more holistic uh, but today because I really only had the camera for uh, a weekend I'm only going to talk about this for photography and I'm going to talk it, about it in a specific way uh, I put a poll out on my YouTube community tab and I asked people what they cared about the most and the top two things were um, image quality and stabilization. And so I'm gonna focus on those because the people who watch the channel have asked me to do that. I had the camera limited time. And so let's dive in and talk about that. So this is not a holistic, complete review and it's not a thorough review. I definitely plan to rent the camera again. So that tells you a little bit of something uh, of how I felt about it. Um, but right now we're gonna jump into what does it mean to have this as a photographer, that's one. And then we'll talk about image quality and then we'll talk about stabilization. All right, for, for a photographer, um, since that's the primary lens I'm gonna use to talk about the Canon R5, the number one thing that you want is control over exposure. Um, so that's typically what photographers value in getting a shot that's meaningful and valuable to them and their client. And so I found that compared to the EOS R, the R5 was actually superior, and let me tell you why. On, on the R, you have a top dial, which you can uh, adjust shutter speed or ISO, something like that, an aperture right here on the main dial, and then that's it. Those are the physical controls, outside of a control ring maybe, um, but you, then you have to tap on the back screen and access ISO, or go into the menu and access ISO. Um, but there's two physical con physical controls, and I'm not talking about the, the control ring. I personally don't use the control ring on the RF lenses, um, or I don't use the adapter with the control ring. But I found that the R5 was superior because it has the, the top dial, has the main dial here, and it has the back wheel. And with those, I was able to adjust shutter speed, aperture, and ISO tactily. Is that a word? Tactfully? No. <laughs> tactily, by touch. So I'd have the camera up to my eye and I would be able to make those adjustments by feel. Now, did I master this over the course of the weekend? Definitely not. But I found that I grew to rely on it more and more. And if I'm being honest, I actually compose better photos when I block out the world and put my eye up against that viewfinder. When I shoot like that, I actually compose better photos that are um, more to the artistic vision I have in mind. I'm less distracted about the other things outside the frame. And so I found that the, the R5, the, the actual mechanical controls, helped me be a better photographer. Um, not just for convenience and being quick at adjusting exposure, but also it helped me get my eye to the glass and block out the outside world and compose a shot and be able to make those adjustments. Um, so that was a, a real advantage. And so for a photographer, that means a lot to me. Now, can I do that on the, on the R? Definitely I can. Um, but I find on the R, I actually am looking at the back screen and I'm making that ice, final ISO adjustment or whatever the third element of exposure that's not a, uh, attached to one of these, um, the top dial or the main, the main dial. I'm, I'm using the back screen a lot. So that means my eyes pulled away. So 
that's an important consideration. Outside of control over exposure, the next thing a photographer might really be uh, concerned about nailing is the focus. We always get, talk about tack sharp images. So how's the R5 uh, perform when it comes to focus? Uh, I will tell you that we took it on a hike on Saturday. I had planned a portrait shoot, um, kind of a dedicated portrait shoot with time with some strobes and natural light on Sunday and also that portrait shoot was inside uh, botanical gardens. Um, and so I also saw some animals. And so, so I did some animal photography, um, kind of fairly casual, uh, but there was squirrels and there were deer and there were birds. Um, so I can tell you that in terms of focus, the portraits were, were not very difficult at all. Um, and I'll actually talk about the hike uh, in a second, but what I wanted to spend time on, uh, what separates the R5 from the R is, um, was exhibited to me through animal eye autofocus. So I was chasing a squirrel, um, not chasing or stalking, I was tracking a squirrel and it was moving down the driveway and I decided to look at the menu, tap on animal eye autofocus. And then as I pursued that squirrel, I was actually shooting like this. I had the camera, the flip screen up at me and I was shooting like that. And because of the brightness of the sun, the brightness of the asphalt, I couldn't really see whether the, the eye autofocus was working. Um, and so I had this down low and I was looking, um, but I couldn't really tell. And even when I reviewed the images and I, I zoomed in, it was so bright out, I couldn't tell on the back screen. And it wasn't until I got the, the images inside the, the computer that I could see that the eye autofocus, the animal eye autofocus was actually working. And not only was it working, it was producing some pretty incredible results. And so there's actually one shot where the squirrel had left the driveway and was vaulting to the stone border um, on the edge of the asphalt. And I caught the squirrel mid air and lo and behold, I was basically just panning. And remember I'm shooting like this, I'm looking down the screen and I'm panning and firing. And the drive mode was high speed continuous and it nailed that focus when the squirrel was in mid flight and so that was, that was actually a stellar shot. I showed it to my wife and uh, my kids that were there. Um, I was really impressed. Now there were also deer there and I was shooting the deer, but they were much further away. I had the RF 28 to 70 lens with me and I wasn't able to get very close. So what was interesting about that is though I could not actually tell if the eye autofocus was on the deer, it was on the deer enough so that when I look at the shots in the computer, there in focus. Now I'm not close enough to drill down and see the eyeball and see if it's really um, tack sharp on that, but I was impressed. It got me shots in focus that I, I couldn't really tell. Now, I don't know if there's something better that needs to be done on the LCD to like light up red or something. So in bright light, you can tell um, that you're actually locked on that animal and that, that eye. But that was something that I noticed is in terms of focus, the animal eye autofocus on the Canon R5 was amazing. It was downright amazing. It was superior to anything on the R. Now, in terms of the portraits, the subjects are still, they're looking at you. Those are obviously locked in and I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna show you some <laughs> pixel peep a little bit and show you how amazing the focus is. Now, these are large 45 megapixel pictures. And so when the eye is sharp, you can actually crop in and get some amazing uh, compositions, even though you were further back. And so that was valuable to me. Now, another thing about the, the human eye autofocus was that there were moments where the subject put their head down. And so I took a shot and the camera had just been focused on their eye and like the bill of the cap went down. Here's a picture I want to show you. And you can see the eyelashes are in so sharp focus. It's obvious. That's where the focal point is. I think it's an amazing camera. And so the portraits came out great. I played around with the color adjustments and developed a few presets that I thought would be cool um, for the portraits. But basically the camera, <laughs> the color, the images straight out of the camera is amazing. It's Canon. It's the color that you expect. Um, but there is an image that I want to share that I thought was particularly intriguing. And it was just of the botanical garden. And so there was one image of these, these cactus or these succulents and a whole um, uh, area of them. And I found that no matter what I did, I, I have like three or four different presets that I adjusted that kind of pull different hues, different ways. They all looked amazing. And so that says something to me about the, 
the natural image that comes from the camera. And I, I found that I had a couple of portraits where I went into black and white and they looked stellar, uh, just like they did in color. So I think the image quality, uh, the, the megapixels definitely help you crop in. I did a few panoramic images where three images were stitched together. One was a view of the Ojai Valley. Another one was a, a pretty hot and dry and dirty <laughs> creek bed that we hiked in. Um, but the amount of detail you can get when you stitch these images together is, is pretty profound. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So um, we have exposure. It's, it's easy to work with. You have those three mechanical controls. The eye out of focus was amazing. It was quick. It gave me shots that I didn't think I could get otherwise. Um, and then just the image quality and the control you have over the color shooting these raw images are uh, really awesome. Now, I don't know that those shots are profoundly different than the EOS R. I know they're bigger, there's more megapixels there. Um, but in terms of, I had planned like a back-to-back, -back, you know, side-by-side -side comparison of here's the EOS R, here's the R5, same shot, same lighting. First thing we're gonna do is set up for some portraits right here in this doorway. I'm gonna use the 70 to 200. I'm gonna take some with natural light, with off-camera light, and I'm gonna compare the same exact shots and settings to the Canon EOS R. Uh, turned out once we got done on Sunday with exploring the botanical gardens, deciding it was too hot for a hike, setting up for the portrait shoot, within minutes people were tapped out and they're like, I'm done, I'm tired. But I did get a few images and um, I thankfully my family put up with me and I, I think they're really stellar and that just goes to show you with just one light and actually I didn't have a modifier so this is the uh, Godox 8200, one light on these subjects in kind of these ruins or um, uh, just sort of a plaza type architecture gave these portraits a really interesting look and I was really grateful that I got the time to shoot those. All right, so I wanna talk about the hike. I took the camera with me everywhere I went. Uh, we went on a hike on Saturday and I don't know what happened. Um, I think my shutter speed was a little bit slow. I had, I think I had eye autofocus on, face tracking. But I found that on Saturday, maybe I was just new with the camera, I missed a whole bunch of shots. Um, I didn't find that the eye autofocus was very sharp. I think that's just due to me being new. It was hot out, we are sweaty, it was bright, um, and I couldn't get used to it. But when we stopped by the creek bed and took a few portraits, I had uh, my trigger on, the Godox X-Pro trigger, and I was holding the AD200 uh, kind of up at a 45 degree angle, shooting one-handed. And so I got some portraits that, that were decent, um, and so it, I know it wasn't the camera, but just on the hike, I just didn't really feel like I nailed anything. We did see a tarantula and uh, that was a hard shot to get. There is no animal eye on the tarantula that it locked into. I found the depth of field was super shallow. And however, I was trying to get the, the tarantula in focus. It was very, very tr tricky. So kudos to those uh, animal uh, photographers out there who are able to shoot spiders. Uh, I don't know if that's a thing, I assume it is, uh, but I found it was very, very tricky. I think we've talked about exposure, it's amazing. We've talked about um, the eye autofocus, amazing. We've talked about the image quality, we pixel peeped a little bit, but really what people wanted to know about was the, was the stabilization. I'd filmed with the R6 the week before. I hadn't done any video other than the 8K RAW the first night, but the second we pulled in to the gardens and I got out of the car, turned the camera on, I looked in the screen, and I hit record and I just started to walk up the garden path and I was honestly shocked by what I saw in the screen because the image stabilization made me feel like I was holding a dolly shot like I was looking at a dolly shot and I, it kind of tripped me out now the weekend before when I had the R6 I had a top handle and kind of a base plate and I didn't really have that you know close proximity of my eye to the screen because I was kind of holding it further away but this I could really see the stabilization at work and it was it was amazing it actually made me feel like I was able to produce a higher quality product smoother shots um, I started to get ideas for like oh I want to do this and then and then I got into shooting 120 frames per second. And so you have the 120 frames per second, the stabilization, and I felt like I was pretty much in love. I was in love. Now, granted the R6, I had an amazing experience as well. And I, it's too early to tell, but I think I prefer the R6. Um, 
but the 120, the 4K 120 on, on the, the R5 was amazing. Now, I, I did see a counter counting down when I was in 120 frames per second. And when it started at seven, seven minutes is what you get in that mode. And as I filmed walking around the botanical gardens, it went down to about two and then I saw a red blinking light. I actually pulled out my cell phone and I recorded it and I was a little tripped out like, what is this? It's overheating. It's And yes, it was the overheating warning. Now it never shut down on me. I did some uh, recording of slow-mo uh, uh, past that point, but I didn't take it all the way to the limit. Uh, but definitely was unnerving and I didn't like seeing that overheating warning. Um, and it felt like only a few minutes, like seven minutes goes by very quickly, especially there was one uh, kind of architectural little statue and I was trying to, I had this wraparound shot, like I'm gonna start in focus, kind of the Daniel Schiffer thing. I don't know if you've seen his, his uh, B-roll where he starts in focus and then he pulls the camera back. So you get that buttery bokeh and then you reverse the clip. Uh, so I was doing that and I did it three, four, five times. And so you're, you're moving around this statue and trying to get very smooth and kind of let the eye auto, or not the eye auto focus, but let the auto focus grab the right part. Um, that, that actually probably ate up a couple of minutes by itself. So the 120 frames per second um, eats up that, um, that overheating uh, time that you're allowed or time till overheating, it eats it up. And I found out that I was looking at, you know, flashing red warning light. And it was hot, that's the other thing. It was hot that day, so I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But I definitely was unnerved by that. However, here's some information straight from the person I rented it from. So uh, Wood Island Media was the, the person I rent from, uh, from. His name is Steve or Steven, I think. Um, and he does video production in LA. And he actually, the first week he bought the Canon uh, R5, he took it on a shoot with Gabrielle Union. Hey, I'm Gabrielle Union, and I just filmed a few new workouts for Fit On. Here we go. And he did 60 exercise videos. He filmed in 4K, 24 frames per second. 60 exercise or fitness videos never once had an overheating issue. So it, it is a workhorse in that respect, and you have to know kind of what lane you're gonna be in. But I got so in love with the, the 120 that I just, I just got in there and I spent too much time there. So I ran to some overheating warnings. For image quality, I'll say it's unsurpassed. I, I know I use the RF lenses, mainly the 35 when I was doing the video and the 28 to 70 for the portraits. Um, it's unsurpassed, it's amazing. So if you shoot the 5D, you're gonna want this. At the end of the day, I would definitely recommend this camera. If you're a photographer, a wedding photographer, if that's your business, this camera is an absolute monster. It's a beast. I don't believe you're gonna run into overheating issues using it for photos. Um, the autofocus was amazing. I've heard people say it's better than anything they've ever seen. I just know it was very good and there's no way I could have got that shot of the squirrel jumping midair in focus without the eye uh, autofocus. Um, and I just know that the image quality is am amazing. The RF glass is amazing, so it's awesome. Is it the camera for me? At this point, the price point is, is kind of high. Uh, so I'm really, really favoring the R6. I don't think that I need the type of megapixels so that I can crop in. Most of my shoots are portraits, food photography, product photography. I can get up and get a get really close to the subject. So I don't need that like shoot wide and then crop in. It's absolutely nice to have, uh, of course. So my, my takeaway, my impression is this is an amazing camera if you have $4,000 to drop. If that's what you're doing with your life, with your profession and, and that makes sense for you, this is a high performing camera, better than probably anything I put my hands on. So I definitely would endorse it for that. Um, now video, I don't, I shot a lot of video cause it was fun and it, the, the image stabilization made the footage look great. Um, that was super fun. I actually got carried away 
That actually tells you something about the video quality. You have to know what you're getting into and if you shoot 4K 24 like Woody Island Media, the guy I rented it from, then you can shoot all day. Thank you for joining me and if you like this video, leave me a, a, a like, a subscribe if you're not subscribed and just uh, stick around and there's gonna be more content on this channel. I'm actually gonna do another uh, video coming up very soon talking about the two uh, promo videos I shot with the R6. Uh, and tell you all about that and share the actual products those short promo films with you. All right, take it easy. See you in the next video